The housing division will come to order. Um, I'd like to announce that this meeting will take place via House Rule 10.01, the text of which is available in your committee documents. Owen sent you a number of documents this morning. Um, before we get started, uh, I, I wonder if um, Blake is there because um, our committee legislative assistant uh, will take the role to note who is present. I am indeed. Can you hear me? I can. Fantastic. Let me pull up my roll sheet. All right. So, Houseman? Here. Beerman? Oh, sorry. Houseman um, Howard? Here. Tice? Saw Tice. You're muted, but I see you here. Hi. <laughs> Beerman? Present. Fisher? Present. Gunther? Present. Hassan? Present. Her? Present. Hornstein? Present. Johnson? Present. Jurgens? Present. Munson? Munson? Pearson? Here. Poppy? Present. Sock? All right. Yep, right in on the roll call. Okay. I believe a quorum is present. That is correct. The so next for consideration is the approval of the minutes from Wednesday, March 11. Representative Howard, have you had a chance to review the minutes? I have, and I'll move the minutes. Representative Howard uh, moves approval of the minutes. We can voice vote approval of the minutes. So members, I'm going to take just a second for all of you to unmute yourselves before I call for everybody is unmuted. Um, Representative Howard has moved approval of the minutes. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. So we will now move on to the agenda. We have one bill on the agenda, House File 4541. As you know, uh, we have changed it significantly since it was introduced because there is a delete all. Um, and members, I'd like to ask if you, um, just because we have a hard uh, end at 930, so uh, we're going to hear from the commissioner and then we're going to have uh, Mary Mullen walk through the bill and then I'd like to take the testifiers we've asked them to try to limit themselves to a couple of minutes um, and so if you would keep uh, a list of the questions you have Owen will um, will be our committee administrator will be keeping a, a list of people who have questions and and uh, so we'll end with uh, questions so uh, committee members you can use the raise hand function on zoom if you've done that or if you're calling in you can raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone to be put on the list to ask a question. And of course, all the committee discussion right. will go through the, uh, the chair once again. Um, and so we'll have all the testifiers address the committee before going on. So um, I, just to get the bill before us in the form that I would like, I'm going to move House File 4541 be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means there's an author's amendment, the DE2 amendment, um, which uh, that's the one that um, uh, Mary Mullen will talk through later. And so I would like to move the DE2 uh, amendment to get the bill in the shape um, that we want to carry it forward. Um, and uh, I'm assuming that it's okay with you just to uh, take the, the role on the DE2 amendment to get it before us. The clerk will take the role on the DE2 amendment. All right, to the DE2 amendment, uh, Representative Houseman. Aye. Howard? Aye. Tice? Aye. Bierman? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Gunther? Aye. Hassan? Aye. Her? Aye. Hornstein? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Jurgens? Aye. Munson? Aye. Pearson? Aye. Poppy? Aye. And Sock? Aye. And that is 15 ayes and zero nays, Madam Chair. 
that um, is, is now before us as the um, as the house file. Uh, just a few words before we hear from the commissioner. Um, this all began uh, with uh, the governor's executive order during this um, uh, time of, of a health crisis. Uh, and among the um, executive orders he has is a moratorium on evictions. Um, he did not forgive debt. Uh, and so um, the renters and, and, and homeowners, everybody still owes what, um, what they are expected to. Um, but we know um, that the workers, there are now over 500,000 uh, applications for unemployment insurance. We know that many of them, because they were employees at uh, restaurants, bars, retail, we know something about um, the level of their salaries. And we know that many of them are probably one paycheck away from uh, being able to pay their bills. And it's in everybody's interest, I think, uh, not to add to our homelessness issue at this point and to keep renters and landlords, everybody stable during this time. Um, and so uh, we began to talk about the issue of rental uh, housing assistance. Um, there's a complexity to drafting this because we also are doing this in the context of a, a federal action through the CARES Act on the very same issue. And so finding a compatible language so that we don't confuse uh, renters and landlords uh, is uh, means it's a sort of a work in progress. Uh, and many stakeholders have uh, weighed in with advice, some law firms, uh, legal aid, and others, and we'll be hearing from a few of them today. So that's the context. Uh, the commissioner has asked to kick us off. Uh, so Commissioner Ho is um, somewhere available. We're going to start with uh, Commissioner Ho. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Houseman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ho, and I'm the Commissioner of Minnesota Housing. Uh, this is my home office. And I'm joined today by Ryan Baumtrog, my Assistant Commissioner for Policy and Community Development, and Lil Robertson, our policy attorney, who is covering for Dan Kitzberger while he's on paternity leave. I just want to let you know that during this pandemic, Dan and his wife had a healthy baby girl on April 10th. We're so delighted to hear that. And Owen, um, she's not on the screen right now. Can you control that? Please continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you for all that all of you are doing for the people of Minnesota during these extraordinary and unprecedented times. I want to applaud your finding a way to conduct open hearings, and thank you for hosting this hearing on matters that are urgent and growing across the state to help people stay at home. I want to use my time to go over three things. First, what Minnesota Housing has done since the outbreak of COVID-19. Second, what we're seeing. And three, what we think is needed. So first, between March 13th and in the week that followed, we transitioned the vast majority of our staff to telework. We executed that with incredible speed, and it's a tribute to my whole team that we now barely have anyone going into the office at all, and when they must, it is for as brief a time as possible. At the same time, we continue to be fully operational with the exception of uh, limiting on-site inspections and, of course, group events. We've opened our annual consolidated RFP with an extended due date. We're still closing multifamily deals, and families are still getting home mortgages. And we're in close contact with our many partners daily. At the same time, we started doing emergency response, especially as it relates to people experiencing homelessness but also in partnership with multifamily, supportive housing, and public housing providers. Right now, a large number of people at high risk, they're getting the information that they need and that the Minnesota Department of Health and the State Emergency Operations Center are anticipating their needs. We also began work immediately with the Attorney General and the Governor's Office on the executive order that suspended evictions, which the governor signed on March 23rd. The governor's message has been clear. It's in the interest of the whole state's public health that people be able to stay at home while that executive order is in place. At the same time, the governor has stressed that Minnesotans should pay their rent or their mortgage if they can, and to work closely with their landlord or their financial institution if they can't. Federal protections have been put in place for people with federally backed mortgages, 
and the federal government has encouraged public housing agencies and others to do the right thing during this pandemic. The governor's evictions executive order provides these protections to all Minnesotans with a few exceptions for safety. So what are we seeing? As you all know, we had a significant housing crisis before the pandemic hit Minnesota. We had nearly 140,000 households that made less than $50,000 and were paying more than 50% of their income on rent. Our shelters were full and the number of people living outside was growing at an alarming rate. Now we have over a half million Minnesotans that have filed for unemployment and rent is due again next Friday. We're tracking all of the federal actions and the CARES Act funding to anticipate how that provides relief to renters, homeowners, landlords, and financial institutions. We're working closely with our partner agencies, including the Department of Employment and Economic Development and the Department of Human Services, to use those resources in ways the state never has before for housing. And we continue to push at the federal level for more housing assistance. We're tracking non-payment across our own portfolio and across the country. Minnesotans were generally ahead of the country in making payments in April, but our family homeless prevention and assistance grantees are seeing increased demand on a program that was already only serving about one in 10 households who needed it. We are all bracing for May. And we know that homeless providers are frantically scrambling to deconcentrate shelters, implement social distancing, procure additional space, and create protection, isolation, and quarantine spaces for people who are already using shelter, as well as for those who are living outside. We're also monitoring the capital markets and tax credit pricing to understand what housing development may look like moving forward. So here's what I think we need. We need to get housing assistance to renters and homeowners in May. As you'll hear today, there's an unprecedented coalition of landlords, tenant advocates, housing providers, and advocacy groups who are supporting the bill that's in front of you today. Thank you for fighting for $100 million for the Family Homelessness Prevention and Assistance Program. This bill is about stabilizing families and helping families and landlords pay their bills. We need a right now plan to help homeless service providers and those they serve who are seeing an unprecedented demand for homelessness prevention resources. The majority of providers are out of resources by the second week of the month. And we need a long-term housing strategy that includes a robust bonding bill so we can let the developer community know that there will be housing infrastructure bonds. And we can let the public housing authorities know that there will be pu public housing preservation bonds. We need to recognize that housing investments are stimulus to get the economy back as quickly as we can once it's safe to do so. Resources in the bonding bill are the agency's number one source of capital from the state. This bill that you're hearing today is a win-win situation. It helps stabilize families during this difficult time while also providing the resources landlords need to pay their bills. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Thank you for your attention to this urgent matter and for all that you are doing. Chair Houseman. I look forward to working with you and others to get this bill over the finish line. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ho. That was very helpful context in which we'll uh, hear other testifiers. And now I'm hoping Mary Mullen is uh, is on. We'll have Mary Mullen from uh, Nonpartisan House Research um, to take us through the bill. Uh, Chair and members, this is Mary Mullen. Can you hear me? A little more volume, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm going to walk through the DE2 amendment. Um, I'm going to start with section one. Uh, this section prohibits residential landlords from charging late fees 90 days after the initial declaration of a COVID-related peacetime emergency. 
and it lasts until uh, January 15th of 2021. This provision also prevents residential landlords from terminating or failing to renew a rental agreement during a COVID-related peacetime emergency. Uh, at this section also has a provision that uh, requires landlords after a peacetime emergency to provide a tenant with a 30-day written notice before filing an eviction action. Uh, and it also um, defines public health emergency, which is a, a public health emergency related to COVID-19. And it allows tenants to have um, an ability to dismiss a case that's filed against them when a landlord has violated the sections, um, portions of this section. The second section is related to foreclosure. This stops uh, ad foreclosures by advertisement and foreclosures by action during a public health emergency related to COVID. And uh, it also links back to that same definition of public health emergency, which is a COVID related public health emergency. Uh, the foreclosure um, moratorium related to COVID does not apply until after this uh, bill has been enacted. Section three is assistance fraud. This provides that anybody who attempts to use the tenant's rights or the foreclosure provisions in this bill or who applies for emergency funding under this bill uh, would be guilty of uh, an attempt to commit uh, theft of public or private funds if they were to lie in any of the applications or the pursuit of any of the benefits. Section four is an appropriation section. It provides uh, $100 million in fiscal year 2020 to the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency for the Family Homeless Prevention and Assistance Program to administer a grant program. Uh, the grant program is for individuals, families, and homeowners in Minnesota to pay uh, rent for residential rentals for uh, their mortgage payments, uh, on payments for contract for deeds, manufactured home park lot, utilities, or property tax payments. Um, so basically, your uh, you know, spending related to housing or staying in their home to prevent homelessness. And it provides the uh, eligibility for the program and the requirements of, of the agency to administer the program. It also requires the agency to do a report on all of the funding that is spent under this. Uh, the money cancels back to the general fund if it's not spent uh, by February 1, 2021. I think that's everything. And um, that, that concludes your presentation? Yes, Chair and members, uh, that's so, all of DE2. I'm sorry? That That is all of what's in the DE2. Okay, and then um, <clears throat> as you note, uh, members, um, we're using the, uh, the FHPAP in Minnesota Housing Family Homeless Prevention uh, Program, which is already set up. Uh, the, the hope is that this money uh, gets reaches the landlords as quickly as possible. The money does go directly to the landlords. Uh, the hope is that at the end of this time, um, that um, that means um, uh, tenants are are not in debt and and everyone has been held stable throughout this. So. Uh, we're, we have a number of testifiers, and I, I think we're joined by our Minnesota Attorney General, Keith Ellison. Is uh, Keith Ellison in the room? We're perhaps still waiting for... I'm right here. Oh, okay. Please proceed. Welcome. Welcome to the committee. Well, thank, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and all committee members. Um, it's hard to think of something more important than trying to keep people housed right now. You can hardly shelter in place if you have no shelter to be in place. And so thank you all for focusing your attention on this issue. According to the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, 
late payments of rent have doubled um, from their normal rate. So Minnesota may be comparatively um, better off in some states, but we still uh, have a real serious problem that we have to address. I uh, hope you will support the bill uh, because based on our experience at the Attorney General's office, it's critical. Uh, the bill provides important relief to renters, homeowners, residents of uh, manufacturing uh, home parks, provides 100 million in relief that is urgently needed and also limits landlords from assessing late fees, terminating or failing to renew leases, initiating evictions. I know this is needed because my office is on the front line of helping Minnesotans respond to the housing crisis that COVID-19 has both caused and exposed. So what we're doing at the Attorney General's office is we're taking strong, swift action to enforce both Minnesota's landlord-tenant laws and the Governor Wall's Executive Order 2014 which suspends evictions and prohibits terminating leases for the duration of the peacetime emergency. Uh, it immediately establishes dedicated uh, tenant eviction complaint, no, we, excuse me, immediately established a dedicated tenant eviction complaint form on the front page of our attorney general website. We pulled together a team of six attorneys to work on protecting tenants during the emergency, and we need them all. We could even use more. This is not a small problem. We're hearing from the public in a big way. As of this week, and, and, and the numbers are probably higher now, uh, we've had about 255 complaints to our tenant eviction complaint form of tenants who fear they'll be removed from their home with nowhere to go uh, during the pandemic. Some have reported that they're behind on their rent because they're unemployed, furloughed, or their hours have been cut. Others who may be current on their rent have um, previously agreed to vacate when their lease ended, but now can't find anywhere to move during the pandemic because of severe shortage of rental housing now. So executive order 2014 gives uh, enforcement power to the attorney general's office. Uh, in most cases, the complaints are easily resolved with just a phone call or a letter. I wanna say most landlords have been cooperative and done the right thing. Usually laws are not for most people, they're for the people who don't, don't do the right thing uh, even, uh, and so they need help from, from the rest of us to urge them to do it. Uh, but I just wanna point out, often it's just uh, the cases we've seen are, are a case of just educating the landlord on the relevant state landlord law and the executive order. Uh, we obtain the landlord's verbal agreement to comply with the order and we follow up with a letter to memorialize that agreement. And we provide a copy of the letter to the tenant for the peace of mind so that they can rest easy while they're trying to deal with the pandemic. We educate them about their rights and responsibilities under state law and the order. But in other cases, landlords have refused to comply. And when that's happened, we have taken action uh, to take them to court and filed enforcement actions to get them to stop doing their illegal action. Uh, let me tell you about three lawsuits we've uh, had to file to stop landlords from unlawfully removing their tenants. The first case is in Sandstone, Pine County. Uh, the couple is sheltering in place with their four-year-old daughter who has an underlying health condition which makes her vulnerable to COVID-19 infection. The landlord shut off the electricity because he wants to sell the property, left them without power, heat, water during sub-freezing temperatures. There's another landlord in Cosmos Minnesota, which is in Meeker County, that owner of a manufactured home park wanted the tenant out uh, because the tenant was behind. Uh, the tenant is on furlough because of COVID-19. Despite that, the tenant made several cash payments on the bill, but the landlord shut off the tenant's water three separate times. The tenant was uh, forced out of the home, living with a friend in another city. We've taken a loss legal action against that, that landlord. And then another third case in McGrath, uh, the city of McGrath, which is in Aiken County, the landlord owns a duplex, downstairs neighbors were behind on their rent, so the landlord refused to refill the propane tank. Upstairs neighbors who are not behind on their rent, but are on the furlough because of COVID-19 complained. The landlord then uh, told them that he wouldn't refill the propane tank and told them to apply for public assistance for helping getting it filled. 
the landlord currently resides in Florida. In all three cases, the landlord violated the executive order and the Minnesota landlord tenant law. In all three cases, my office filed lawsuits and quickly won temporary restraining orders that require the landlords to one, restore utilities immediately, two, not interrupt them illegally in the future, and three, to not do anything to interfere with the tenant's right to live um, and peacefully enjoy the property. In all three cases, the tenants have told us that the enforcement efforts, uh, that our enforcement efforts, whether we've resolved their complaint quickly by letter or phone, or uh, whether we had to take the landlord to court, have helped them and made uh, them uh, far more uh, able to deal with the, the pandemic. Um, some have become emotional and cried with relief when we told them that the landlord cannot kick them out during the pandemic. And we've made the difference, uh, I think, at the AG's office between families having to move into a homeless shelter or who Lord knows where uh, being uh, potentially exposed to COVID-19 and losing their belongings versus being able to safely, safely shelter in place. That doesn't only benefit them. It benefits every single Minnesotan because as people leave their shelter and have to be out into the community, sometimes in a densely populated area like a homeless shelter, that can be, spreads the virus. So this is actually not just decent and understanding for the individual, it also is a public health benefit. Let me wrap up, uh, Madam Chair, by just making a, a few quick reflections. I wanna be clear that most landlords are doing the right thing. The ones who have violated most of them, have we been able to resolve these matters without taking them to court? But they, we need the tools to deal with some who just won't listen, those who are absentee, those who are heartless and heedless. Uh, and so um, we far and away prefer compliance. We don't really want to bring a lawsuit. We feel that we're compelled to, and, but we need that tool in order to protect those people most vulnerable. So my job as uh, Attorney General, in my view, is to help enforce the law, which means helping people to afford, afford their lives and live with dignity and respect that is especially critical right now. And I'm gonna to continue to use my power under the state law and the executive order to protect the right to tenants. But I can tell you this, the bill that you're just contemplating today will not only help people in the short term, but after the pandemic is over, it, it won't be over. The economic damage won't be over. And we need intervention to make sure that we don't set off a chain of events starting with non-payment of rent, resulting in foreclosures, resulting in perhaps ultimately bank failures, your intervention is helping to stabilize the economy in a very precarious time. And so I thank you for your action. I also wanna say that even before this pandemic, we had holes in our social safety net. The pandemic has revealed them and exposed them in dramatic ways. The action you take today is helping to fill those gaps, and we appreciate it. Last word, we've also been very active in stopping price gouging, banned per executive order 2010. We've, we've received more than 1,500 price gouging complaints. Uh, we have a dedicated form on the website. We've conducted more than 100 secret, secret shopper uh, research trips, sent out more than, uh, than 35 enforcement letters. We've seen a spike in scams. We've seen a lot of online attempts at scams. And I want you to know we're working very closely with county attorneys and the U.S. attorney. Uh, we formed a task force in the, in the partnership. This three-level of government task force is operating to the benefit of Minnesotans. Finally, we've even seen 55 complaints of wages being illegally withheld, unpaid or stolen. Uh, and uh, so we've been active in that space as well. Thank you for considering this much needed legislation. And um, that's all I have to present today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and yeah. Next, we have Ann Mavity from the Minnesota Housing Partnership. She is going to be followed by Akoa Ellis, um, Senior Vice President from Great, uh, Twin Cities United Way. So up next, Ann Mavity. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. 
Great. Thank you so much. So again, I'm Ann Mabity, and I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Housing Partnership. As you know, we work with local communities and tribes across Minnesota on housing challenges, and we convene stakeholders across the entire housing continuum to advance affordable housing in our state. And I think our deputy policy director, Libby Murphy, is familiar to most of you. So today I want to speak to uh, House File 4541 and first of all say thank you for recognizing this enormous housing challenge faced by Minnesota's low-income families. And it's reflected by your commitment of $100 million in this desperately needed housing assistance um, allocated through an existing program that the state can quickly deploy, the FHPAP program. So at least $100 million is needed. And it simultaneously accomplishes two goals. First, it provides critical assistance to low-wage Minnesotans who are struggling to pay their rent and who prior to this crisis were already making hard choices on how their meager income would stretch to cover food and health care after their housing costs were paid. So simply, it prevents homelessness. Second, it ensures that our housing system has sufficient rental income revenue to keep the doors open and maintain our housing stock. The lessons that we learned by the housing recession more than a decade ago point to the effectiveness of investing in helping people maintain their housing rather than dealing with and paying for the more costly uh, approach that occurs when families lose their housing. In early April, a survey was conducted by the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund and Housing Link. It surveyed 31,000 units, about 5% of our rental housing stock. And it found strains already appearing in Minnesota's housing markets. First, it found that rental income declined about 16% in April as compared to March 2020. So this rate of decline represents a rental income across um, the entire housing market of about $60 million statewide just for April. And so while we applaud the quick response that the state and the federal governments have made to provide unemployment support to families who've lost their income, we know that these supports will be insufficient to sustain rental and home ownership um, households who will be increasingly stretched financially, not just for a month or two, but through the end of the year, as this public uh, health emergency continues to impact individuals and in the economy. So we want to encourage you to continue to target and focus this scarce resource on renters and homeowners that are at or below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. There's simply not enough funding to spread this around too broadly. But all of you, we understand, have difficult choices to make on allocating scarce resources. Having a home and maintaining housing is critical, not just to individual families, but to stable communities and to sustaining the housing market. And as you'll hear from others, we have this extraordinary coalition across the housing continuum that support this strategy. So I'm happy to answer further questions. Please act quickly. This money is needed to pay May's rent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mavity. Um, and we are joined now by Akoa Ellis from the Greater Twin Cities United Way. And then uh, up after her will be the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity. So uh, welcome, Ms. Ellis. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Akua Ellis, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Impact for Greater Twin Cities United Way. I'm joining you this morning in my capacity at United Way and as a supporter of the Homes for All Coalition to testify in support of additional funding for the Family Homelessness Prevention Assistance Program. And I'll refer to it as FHPAP going forward just because it's a mouthful. Uh, at Greater Twin Cities United Way, our mission is to build pathways toward prosperity and equity for all, touching over 500,000 lives across the nine county metro area. We all know that a stable home is foundational for Minnesotans to thrive, yet many families struggle to access and maintain stable housing, and especially now. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been particularly difficult for Minnesotans in low wealth households. Closures of restaurants, small businesses, and other employers have put hourly workers in challenging positions when it comes to paying rent mortgages and bills. In fact, data from the Greater Twin Cities United Way's 211 resource helpline shows that Minnesotans are concerned about losing their housing. And I am going to try to share a graphic with you all here. Uh, let's see. Test my tech skills. 
Are you able to see it? Are you able to see the graphic? Yes, yes. Awesome. So this graph illustrates rent assistance referrals made by 211 Helpline Specialist for Twin Cities Metro Counties during the last two weeks of March of this year compared to the same period of time last year. And as you can see, there has been a dramatic increase. Uh, in the last two weeks of March of this year, our 211 team referred roughly 450% more callers from Hennepin County to rent assistance resources compared to last year. And in Ramsey County, that increase was nearly 250%. In surrounding counties, the increase in rent assistance request was quite frankly, astounding. At 900% for Anoka County residents, over 800% in Washington County, and a roughly 700% increase in Dakota County. These individual requests for support coupled with what we're hearing from our nonprofit partners are why we are supporting a significant investment in emergency funding for the FHPAP. And let me just close the slide. Well, uh, FHPAP is an extremely important program that can be used for direct assistance, such as rent, utilities, and other expenses, or for services like a housing search or navigation for low wealth families at imminent risk of homelessness. The need for emergency FHPAP funding is supported. I'm sorry, excuse me. Let's see. Uh, oh, okay, something happened with my screen. I'm sorry about that. The need for FHPAP funding is supported by a wide variety of organizations, and we believe this is an important way to get support to renters and landlords to help stabilize access to an already scarce resource across our state. As our community navigates the COVID-19 crisis, Greater Twin Cities United Way is committed to supporting those impacted by its effects and bringing the community together in the face of tremendous set of challenges that are presented by this pandemic. We certainly appreciate the hard work and flexibility that you all are demonstrating uh, and urge your support for this emergency funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Um, and now we're joined by um, the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity, Kristen Inciti. I'm, I Please correct my pronunciation of, of the name if I didn't get that right. Welcome to the committee. Yeah, Chair Houseman and members of the division, um, thank you for having me. My name is Kristen Incity, and I am the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity Minnesota. We are a state support organization for 28 Habitat affiliates around the entire state, representing both urban and rural areas in Minnesota. Habitat has been working throughout Minnesota for more than 35 years, providing homeownership opportunities for low and moderate income households who otherwise would not be able to achieve affordable homeownership. Thank you for your efforts to support affordable housing and including an appropriation to support a real need in Minnesota families as we've already heard today. Um, I think it's also important to note that Habitat affiliates are different than typical um, single family developers or typical mortgage holders. Um, most Habitat affiliates hold their mortgages themselves. They operate like a bank and um, homeowners who purchase homes through their program pay Habitat affiliates. They are not federally backed mortgages. Um, they are backed by community support and Habitat affiliates in their communities. So I think that's an important designation. Um, as many of you know, and we continue to hear today, we learned a great deal about the need for affordable homeownership and the barriers to achieving it and maintaining it over the last decade through the Great Recession. We know that it is less costly and easier for us to keep people in their homes now rather than lose them, lose their housing. We know that it is better for each household to avoid longer term debt and to make their mortgage payments every month rather than try to dig out of delinquencies down the road. We also know that our state fares better financially when households maintain their ownership than when we need to recover from those losses. Any and all efforts to prioritize keeping families in their homes today will support a stronger future for our state. So thank you again for this appropriation and this bill. All 28 Habitat affiliates from around the state are receiving calls from their homeowners asking for some financial relief. In preliminary reviews, nine out of 12 affiliates stated that food service and restaurant work was one of the main jobs their homeowners held, followed by other service industry roles that have since either been slowed or eliminated due to pandemic, including hair salon um, owners and other small business owners. Affiliates are estimating between 10 to up to 50% of their homeowners being behind on their payments due to layoffs and furloughs in May. Representing these 28 Habitat affiliates around the state, we're thankful for this bill and this emergency funding. We're also thankful for the intentional note about utilizing the resource for mortgage payments and other relevant homeownership expenses. 
We know this fund has historically been focused on rental assistance, and we look forward to working with the agency on ensuring eligible homeowners can readily access this direct financial relief in their communities before foreclosure is imminent. Stay at home works best when families can actually stay at home, as we all know. Parents are able to provide a stable environment for their kids. Seniors more are able to age well at home, and our public health stays well if everyone has a safe, stable, and affordable home. It's critical to our state that we prioritize this in our communities. Thank you so much for this opportunity and your time. And of course, I'll be available for questions at the end of the call. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we have uh, Jenny Larson from Three, River, uh, Three Rivers Cap. She is an FHPAP provider. Um, following um, Ms. Larson will be Ron Elwood from Legal Aid. Ms. Larson, welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Jenny Larson. I'm the executive director at Three Rivers Community Action in Zimbroda. We're a nonprofit agency providing opportunities to households with low and moderate incomes um, throughout Southeast Minnesota. We're also one of 24 community action agencies across the state. Uh, about half of our work is housing related. We own and develop and operate rental housing. And we have a robust homeownership program serving first time home buyers and uh, households of color. And we also provide homeless prevention and assistance programs. And that's kind of the capacity I wanted to talk about today. Um, I wanna strongly support an allocation of housing assistance through the FHPAP program. Um, we at Three Rivers, we're an administrator of the FHPAP program and um, as has been mentioned before, even before the COVID crisis, the program is in high demand and was in high demand. We were, we were able to serve about 10% of the applicants who come to our agency for, for assistance. Um, we've turned away almost 200 households in the last six months uh, from the program, just simply because we didn't have the resources. Uh, as we all know, wages aren't keeping up with rents in good economic times. And when families are losing income, uh, the problem gets worse. Uh, April 1st marked a new quarter for us in the FHPAP program, and our allocation was quickly spent. We tracked the um, needs of the households that applied for the assistance uh, this month, and 72% of our applicants had COVID-related needs. So most of them had lost income um, due, to, due to the COVID crisis. Every day we're getting many calls from people who have never had to call us before. They are unsure of how to get assistance, they're unsure what they qualify for, and most of all, they're worried about paying their rent or their mortgage. We need more resources to help these families. FHPAP is a quick way to get resources out to the entire state. Uh, providers like us have experienced staff who not only connect them with the housing assistance that they need, but also the other available resources. Um, agencies are located throughout the state. We have a handle on what's available at the local level, um, but also the state and federal resources. We're often connecting families to more than just housing assistance. I also want to highlight that in greater Minnesota, um, the FHPAP program is often the only prevention assistance funds available. We don't get uh, large allocations um, in most of our communities of other federal funds or other sources that can be used for, for housing assistance. And so this is often it. Um, and, I, and I would say a majority of the funds go to small landlords. So the, the families that we're serving are in duplexes, triplexes, um, small, small rental, um, Units And these landlords, if they don't collect, get the rent that's collected, they're likely to sell their properties or to, um, to stop being landlords. And that just makes the housing crisis uh, worsen in our smaller communities. So I just want to close by saying thank you for making housing um, assistance a priority as we work to recover in Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. And we're joined now by uh, Ron Elwood from Legal Aid, and after him would be Cecil Smith, uh, who's president of Minnesota Multi Housing. Uh, welcome, Mr. Elwood. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. It's really nice to actually see you all, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, be able to wear a jacket and tie, which I haven't done since March 12th. 
but seriously, I really want to thank the authors and the committee for your work and your efforts during this crisis to ensure housing stability, which, as Commissioner Ho noted, is the bedrock policy needed to combat this pandemic. Um, Legal Aid strongly supports House File 4541's eviction and foreclosure response and its provision of housing assistance, all of which is intended to help and protect both renters and landlords, homeowners and mortgagees, manufactured homeowners and manufactured home park owners, contract for deed purchases and sellers, and condo owners and homeowners associations and utility customers and utilities. And I think that is the reason I wanted to tick that all off is because I want to really recognize and applaud the scope of the protection that you've proposed in House File 4541 to address all Minnesotans at risk of losing housing and the entities that provide that housing and the situations that have place housing at risk. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of other points. Um, first of all, uh, in their letters, the Minnesota Bank Bankers Association and the Minnesota Credit Union um, Network um, seek an exception to the foreclosure moratorium for abandoned properties. And I just want to note, I worked with them and many others during the foreclosure crisis in the mid-2000s uh, on many issues, but one of which was to enhance the ability to have cities and lien holders uh, more rapidly acquire abandoned properties so they don't lay fallow and have all the problems associated with that. So I just want to support the Bankers Association and the Credit Union's suggestions for that friendly amendment. Um, in closing, I just want to uh, say that we really look forward to working with you, the landlords, the banks, and others uh, when these protections expire to address the fallout. I think um, Attorney General Ellison uh, flagged this as something that we're going to have to uh, keep our eye on as we go forward, but that's for then. For now, this bill is critical, and I reiterate Legal Aid's strong support for it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. And now we have uh, Cecil Smith, uh, president of uh, Minnesota Multi Housing. Um, Dana Snell from the Minnesota Homeownership Center will follow. Um, welcome to the committee. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Cecil Smith. I am president and CEO of the Minnesota Multi Housing Association. MHA is made up of 1,800 members representing over 400,000 units of housing in the state. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on House File 4541. My comments today are less direct to the bill itself and more to what I believe a COVID-19 housing bill should accomplish for our residents. The conversations around COVID-19 rental assistance have been ongoing for just over a month and without any conclusion. If the current situation continues, one absent any assistance or certainty, this would put our residents at serious financial risk and so would destabilize the housing market. This is why we are asking for rent payment support and policy certainty, such as timelines and processes. Earlier this week, Mr. Matthew Desmond, who operates the eviction lab, highlighted that, quote, though Minnesota has some of the strongest protections in place, without any action on rental debt, Minnesota could see a surge of evictions soon after the state emergency expires, end quote. Further to Mr. Desmond's point, we need to consider how to off-ramp the eviction moratorium so that evictions can be done in an orderly way and not overwhelm the courts. But to best avoid, avoid that, the imperative must be significant rental assistance. In conclusion, I urge legislators and those specifically negotiating on the COVID-19 housing bill to focus on funding rental assistance and a planned eviction moratorium off-ramp. If these two items are addressed, we can improve the situation and position Minnesota better than most other states to serve our residents. Thank you again, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, Dana Snell. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Dana Snell. I am the Grants Management Director at the Minnesota Homeownership Center. The center believes that owning a home is a foundation for personal success. For 25 years, we've worked to educate home buyers on the complicated process of qualifying for a mortgage and transitioning to sustainable home ownership. We partner with more than 40 community-based organizations, some of which are speaking today throughout Minnesota, to offer unbiased homebuyer advising and education. 
Last year, 63% of the households served represented communities of color, and the median income was $38,000. We also support current homeowners experiencing challenges maintaining ownership via our foreclosure counseling program. Since 2008, we've worked with network partners to help more than 37,000 households successfully avoid foreclosure and maintain the stability that homeownership provides. With the economic and financial upheaval from the COVID-19 pandemic, we anticipate demand for foreclosure prevention services to increase dramatically over the short term. The center is determined to prevent a repeat of the 2008 foreclosure crisis when so many lower and middle income households lost so much. We worked quickly to raise and deploy resources to support households and communities through foreclosure prevention services. But still, Minnesota experienced a staggering 135,000 foreclosures between 2008 and 2014. Households of color were disproportionately impacted and have yet, not yet fully recovered. In order to be more successful this time round, we need immediate, strong leadership and bold action. Extending the Family Homelessness Prevention and Assistance Program to be benefit owners as well as renters is an example of such bold leadership. We're ready to ramp up our programming to help every homeowner that needs help. Homeownership preservation is homelessness prevention, and we commend you for your vision. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us this morning. Um, next up is Tony Carter, who is the chair of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners. Following her will be Paul Williams, president and CEO of Project for Pride and Living. Um, Ms. Carter, you are next up. Madam Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today, and especially in this unique setting. I'm Commissioner Tony Carter. I'm chair of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners, and I'm here to voice our strong support for the bill that you uh, have introduced and to thank you so much for it. As you know, Ramsey County needs you to be successful in this effort. And if anything, we are hoping to see additional bigger investments in affordable housing needs for this session. Um, as you know, again, we needed this bill before COVID-19 and now with it even more. Whether you can include these funds in a bonding bill or in another later bill, we at Ramsey County are here to stand with you. Did so we regarding just lose our your voice, homeless, can you hear me? Uh, no, we just we just lost you, but you're back now, I think. Okay, great. Regarding our homelessness efforts at Ramsey County, we took rapid steps to protect our vulnerable populations from COVID-19 early. We proactively moved individuals over the age of 60 out of a shelter environment and into a hotel for their protection. But as the weather is getting warmer, we're beginning to see an increase in the number of encampments across Ramsey County. And there is this perception that being in an isolated campsite is safer than being in a crowded shelter. So as you know, these congregate campsites, as they get larger, will invite more and more dangerous and unsavory elements beyond COVID-19. Yesterday, our county board passed a measure to delay penalties for late payment of property taxes due May 15th for COVID-affected certain properties, homeowners, and small and medium-sized businesses. We included support of your bill, Madam Chair, and supporting the state's renters credit program as a way to get assistance to those renters during these tough times. Family homelessness prevention program dollars are critical to keep people in their homes and to help property owners pay their mortgage and taxes. If people become homeless or lose their houses during this time, the assistance system is simply overloaded. Ramsey County is currently looking at options to decrease the volume of individuals in our homeless shelters to help us maintain the social distancing requirements. And an influx of individuals into the system at this time would destroy any ground that we've gained in these efforts. Our staff have been getting requests to use CDBG for rental assistance for several of our suburban cities 
it doesn't work really well for that. And we don't have enough funds to be flexible. But the demand is so great for assistance from the county that increasing the funding for FHPAP would be of enormous help. I want to thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to be heard for your time and attention today. Uh, Commissioner Carter, what you remind us of is how big this problem is and that it really does require every level of government, federal, state, and local, uh, to be part of the solution. And so we're grateful for uh, all of the work that local governments are doing uh, along with us. Um, so thank you for being with us, Commissioner Carter. Thank you very uh, Paul much. Paul Williams, President and CEO of Project for Pride and Living. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Chair Hausman, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Paul Williams. I'm the President and CEO at Project for Pride and Living. Uh, I want to speak today really just to the specific experience of PPL as an example of the impact that this uh, could have on the folks who live with us. PPL has been around for close to 50 years providing uh, affordable housing uh, for folks in a variety of ways, both ownership and, and rental. We own close to own and manage close to 1,600 units of housing in uh, both central city areas as well as suburban areas in the metro area. Uh, close to 3,500 folks live with us uh, every night, uh, some in uh, who are very low income, uh, many of whom are more workforce uh, housing, retail and service workers, healthcare, hospitality workers. So one of the things that we're seeing at PPL is this is, this is very much a workforce housing issue. The folks who are most challenged by the inability, by losing their jobs in this first wave of job losses are in fact what I call worker bees. Uh, and so uh, we really uh, were, were concerned about uh, four things in particular. One is, is obviously the challenges uh, to the ability of folks to pay rent. Uh, Ann Mavity mentioned the 16% uh, April uh, 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 rental loss uh, estimate. That's pretty much on, on par with what we saw in April. We absolutely expect May, June, and the upcoming months uh, to be e even worse. And for us at PPL, uh, our initial estimate is anywhere from a 20 to 40% rental loss uh, figure for through the end of the year. So for us, just a, a specific dollar amount, that translates into a 3 to $5 million impact on PPL's uh, bottom line budget. We're a, we're a bigger, strong organization, uh, but with a, with a base budget of about $24 million, that 3 to $5 million impact just this year uh, is not sustainable. And as one of the larger nonprofit developers, that are the engines of producing, especially our lowest income housing, um, that won't be sustainable. Uh, it, it won't anywhere near uh, uh, sustainable kind of for the long haul. And so, so one of the things that we're concerned about is, is uh, we're appreciative of, of the federal uh, uh, extensions on the unemployment insurance. Um, we think that's gonna help you know, for, for a couple, three months. I think the additional $600 uh, benefit extends for about four months. Uh, that is really, it's, it's, it's what happens Kind of during and after that expires that we're most uh, we're most concerned about. So um, uh, the third point I want to quickly make is is uh, keeping um, keeping the nonprofit development sector uh, active in housing is is both you know a short term uh, strategy but also long term in terms of our ability to produce as a number of people have said in in an environment where we already had um, an affordable housing crisis, we need to keep producing, which really leads to my, my fourth point, which is um, strong appropriation of housing assistance is critical in order to ensure that we can target households that are closest uh, to the edge. We, we had this crisis before, we will have it again uh, going forward. Um, we think the bonding bill uh, proposals, the $500 million is incredibly important in terms of future production, uh, but we're, we're very much in support of uh, House File 4541 which will help bring resources to folks right now, again, particularly those worker bees. Thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And next up is Eric Hauge, who's the Executive Director of Homeline, and then uh, he'll be followed by Arthur Allen from Aon. Um, Mr. Hauge, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee for the opportunity to testify on this bill. Homeline operates a statewide legal hotline for renters. Since opening, we've advised nearly a quarter million renter households most recently, we've advised over 700 renter households impacted by COVID-19 related housing instability in hundreds of cities throughout the state. Because of that, we support that this bill includes 100 million in rental assistance, 
and that language in section one requires a pause on late fees and allows for the suspension of lease terminations to continue with possible future extensions of the peacetime emergency until January. We are also strongly support the bill's 30 day notice period after the emergency. That being said, as much as we want to trust that the governor will continue to extend the emergency, we have to advise our primarily low income clients for the worst case scenario that there is not enough rental assistance and a flood of evictions are filed once the peacetime emergency ends, currently set for May 13th, always less than 30 days out. Further, because it's unclear how soon an emergency will end, we're concerned it could end before the Federal CARES Act timeline. A shorter suspension than the CARES Act will lead to mass confusion for tenants, landlords, and the courts. Landlords may be required to swear under oath that they are not covered under the CARES Act in order to file an eviction and many small operators may not know exactly what financing they have. A bill like this clearly covers all rentals in the state, unlike CARES, which is maybe 30%, and so it should at minimum require that a suspension track the CARES Act timeline in order to simply reduce uncertainty and confusion. The risk is really on the short end, not the long end. Further, we think the bill should more clearly ratify and closely track the language of Executive Order 2014 regarding the suspension of evictions under 504B, 285, and 291. That order also includes exception for evictions under 171 subdivision one. We have a variety of technical fixes and suggestions and are happy to share those details. Uh, without them, we believe they could create complicated and possibly harmful legal questions for our clients. Again, we always have to advise our clients for the worst case scenario. Thanks again for your time. And um, it, that has always been our goal in this. It's um, that this is just about the worst way to draft legislation when you can't sit around the table ever and you're always speaking only by phone or, or in this form, format. But the goal has always been how do we um, how do we reflect uh, the uh, executive order um, and how do we uh, work in concert with the, the Federal CARES Act because of course. Uh, what, you, what you've uh, reminded us of, we do not want to add to the confusion that both landlords and tenants feel at this particular time. So it is a work in progress. I hope there's uh, maybe a solution on the horizon there. Thank you, Mr. Hauge. Uh, Arthur Allen from Aon, and um, welcome to the committee. Um, uh, we, had, we had expected uh, that we would be seeing you in quite a different um, way. Your work with Representative Howard on uh, naturally occurring affordable housing was some really exciting work and necessary work. And um, we were on our way to spend some time on that until this, uh, this uh, health crisis happened. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to re-engage with Representative Howard and you and your work on naturally occurring affordable housing. Welcome Thank to you, the committee. Thank you, Chair Hausman. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing that work as well. Chair Hausman, committee members, uh, I am Alan Arthur, the president and CEO of Aon, a Minnesota nonprofit organization that produces, preserves, you're talking about NOAA, owns and operates 5,586 affordable apartment homes for 12,000 people throughout the Twin Cities. Uh, I really um, thank you for your time this morning. You know, Aon's purpose is a simple one, and that's to make home possible for people who, who wouldn't otherwise have that opportunity. At the start of this legislative session, before we hit the COVID-19 challenges, there seemed to be a broad uh, bipartisan agreement that the legislature should address affordable housing uh, sometime this session. I know that you and your compadres at the legislature uh, face a very challenging crisis, obviously. I respectfully suggest that the shortage of affordable housing remains one of those crisis issues now very much related, as you've heard from all the other testimony, very much related to COVID-19. Affordable housing was in crisis before the pandemic and remain, remains so. For many years, Minnesota has been uh, losing affordable homes faster than we have build, been building new ones. Last year, I stated in a, in a Star Tribune interview that decades of converging economic, social, market, and policy trends are pushing us towards 20 years, what will be the worst housing situation for lower income households since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, for some people that seemed alarmist at the time, uh, but unfortunately it is now almost a given. This was the situation before COVID-19 and its economic fallout. Now the problem we face is worse, very, very much worse. The incredible loss of jobs that you've heard from others about uh, due to COVID-19 layoffs, especially hit hard on families and individuals at the lower end of the economic ladder. That's clearly outlined by Commissioner Ho. 
families who are already paying more than 50% of their meager income are now being actually set up, set up by what's happening to be economically evicted at some point, as Eric Hauge pointed out and Keith Ellison pointed out. And that's true no matter how long the eviction moratorium lasts. No matter how long it lasts, without the kind of support for residents that you are considering here today, the wave of economic eviction will be massive. Compared to March rents, a decrease in paid rents in April in April ranged from 5% to 30% for various owners across the state. Most of, expect, uh, of us expect that to double in May and June. For example, at Aon, it looks like we'll end April at around 10% down, uh, mostly because our residents are scrambling just in the last few days to pay April's rent, which really is, means they're borrowing from what they would have used for May to pay rent, and they won't be able to pay May's rent. These families rely on their very low wages. They get from cleaning our buildings, all of our buildings, after we go home at night and who work all the service wage jobs, or I should say, who just lost those jobs uh, because they were laid off, many of them. Unpayable rents, uh, as Cecil has said, not only damage our residents, but will seriously damage the ability for owners to operate our properties in a decent way. Many affordable properties will go into technical foreclosures, some already have. Our new economic realities put greater and greater pressure on those of us who operate affordable housing and of course is crushing the people we serve. Seniors, families relying on those very low wages uh, and others. So there was a powerful case for this bill really before COVID-19 and the economic fallout. It's now even more critical. $100 million in rental assistance that you have on your table can put a big dent in the problem to not only help keep people in their homes but help ensure that the affordable housing that you have worked on for so many years helped create and support remain decent, safe homes and assets in the communities you represent. From Hibbing to Hendricks, from Roseau to Rochester, our state is going to see a doubling of homelessness. This bill and the $100 million proposed for rent support for families and individuals in our communities can help keep homelessness from tripling or worse. If you'd like to see my, my, my projections about why all of that is true, I'm happy to give them to you. So your support at this critical moment can help make the difference. Thank you, Chairman Hausman and members, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are now ready to go to member questions and uh, our committee administrator has been um, uh, tracking. So just, just to remind you, um, that um, you can use the raise hand function on Zoom if you've used that before, or if you're calling in, you can uh, press star nine uh, on your phone to be put on the list. Uh, uh, our committee administrator has been keeping the list. I can't see him, but so he'll, uh, he'll just give me the name of the, of the first person up. Do we have people on the list, uh, Owen? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the first person on the list is Representative Jurgens. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions. The first is for Attorney General Ellison, if he's still on. I, w I wonder if we've kept everybody online. Quite, is, uh, is, it, is the Looks Attorney like General on. still on? Looks like yes, he's I'm here. Back. I'm right here. Okay, Attorney General Ellison. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on uh, the governor's executive order 20-14 suspending evictions and or this bill and how it, it relates to contract for deed? Uh, for example, if, uh, if a contract for deed is ending at the end of, say, June, and at that time the buyer is to come up with the full purchase price for the home, but because of the economy they're out of work or, or for whatever reason they aren't able to do that, uh, what rights then does, where does this, where does that fall with the suspension of evictions? Because starting the, the next month, that, that person would not have a legal right in that home. Are, are they bound by the same suspension of evictions? Uh, first of all, let me tell you that um, I would like to get back to you on the answer to that question because I want to give you an exact and precise and certain answer. Okay. Uh, at this time, what I would give you is a, impression based on my memory of the words of the of the uh, executive order but uh, uh, how about I get I provide that answer for you in writing uh, uh, you know by end of day 
Oh, that'd be perfect. Thank you very much. And Attor uh, Attorney General Ellison, if you uh, can send that to our committee, we'll distribute it to all of the members of the committee as well. We'll do. We'll Thank do. you very much. Second and, question, Representative. And Madam Chair, uh, the, the second question I have is, uh, has to do with the Section 4, uh, the funding of $100 million, and just wondering where that money is going to come from. I've heard projected surplus and reserves, we all know that the, the projected surplus is gone. I mean, that we can't expect that. There hasn't been an official update on that, but with the reduction of sales tax, corporate tax, and income tax, plus the other side of the ledger, the increase in expenses, I'm just curious. I, I don't know where that $100 million will come from. I'm wondering um, if somebody could, could help us with that, please. So, um, Representative Jurgens, uh, the, the bill goes to the Ways and Means Committee, and my understanding from uh, Representative Carlson is that MMB has talked to him about, um, do, we, we don't normally have a forecast <laughs> and, and an update, but I think um, they're having discussions in Ways and Means about how they can get uh, a more clear sense of where we are um, early in May. And so I, I think the decision there uh, will, will happen in the Ways and Means Committee to determine the um what, what the budget looks like at that particular point okay all right thank you yeah uh next next person on the list uh <clears throat> next uh thank you madam chair next person on the list is representative hassan uh, uh, representative hassan good morning uh chair hasman and members i want to thank chair hasman and everyone else who has worked tirelessly on this legislation House file 4541 is a starting point to address an immediate need, however more is needed. For money, the scariest part about COVID-19 is how quickly it's laying bare the structural flaws in our society. My constituents in South Minneapolis who are largely renters are already facing a housing crisis before the virus came along. Rents are low, our vacancy rates are low, rents are too high, and finding an affordable home is earliest task. We have a responsibility to protect all Minnesotans and having an adequate housing is the best protection we can provide right now. If we do not pass this landmark housing assistance bill, the racial and economic disparities in Minnesota will be laid bare, leading to a massive increase in homelessness across the state. It will take a long time for the economy to recover and even when it does, it will be a ghost of itself former South with many jobs lost permanently. The economy alone will not save us, but we have the power and the responsibility to take action today to ensure that this terrible crisis is not followed by an equally devastating second crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hassan. That's a very helpful um, advice and it puts it in the larger context of um, other challenges that we still have to, uh, to deal with. Next uh, person on the list. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next on the list is Representative Tice. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. When we first started these conversations, the governor was proposing around $10 million. And I'm wondering if you know where he is standing on that right now. The governor now strongly supports the $100 million. Um, at his uh, housing commissioner, I think that was one of the reasons that she wanted to uh, kick us off, uh, kick it off today. Um, but the governor um, is a strong supporter of the hundred million, and I'm guessing that he now understands uh, what so many of our testifiers have said, as uh, the, the the scope of this um, the challenge that we have before us. And I think that has changed his uh, point of view. Representative Tice, follow up. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you know, the part that I get stuck on is the amount of money and. Yesterday, the Council for Economic Advisors announced that they have concerns that our budget reserves and any projected surplus will run out before the end of this fiscal year. So my biggest concern is that we're going to promise what we can't deliver. And I would like to see us at least start with what the Senate is proposing, and that's 30 million. And if we do need to adjust it, that we come back later when we see how the revenues are doing. And of course, a lot of this has to do with when we get back to work and we get the taxes started to, to be paid. I know we're seeing in a few communities where they're even pushing property taxes back, which is very helpful for landlords, but it's not helpful for our counties and our cities. 
So I'm really nervous about probably the domino effect we're going to be seeing and dealing with when we finally open up Minnesota and get back to business. Um, it's going to be hard for a lot of folks to get their feet under their legs and start going again. And that includes our cities. Um, they're seeing issues too that they haven't seen before. And so they're really not sure how things are going to go. So my biggest concern is the dollar amount. I think we should start lower and um, if need be, try to figure out how we can adjust that and go higher as we go along. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and, and as Representative Jurgens uh, indicated too, you, you have some of those same issues and I'm hoping that by the time we get to Ways and Means, uh, and I've already spoken to Representative Carlson about this, that he intends to, to uh, he and um, the MMB commissioner have had some conversations about how quickly we could get uh, some new numbers. Um, the, the forecasted numbers aren't uh, relevant anymore, but when, when can we get some new numbers so that we have a, a sense of what's possible? So hopefully that will happen in ways and means. Um, did you have another follow-up, Representative Tice? Uh, the next person? Thank you, Madam Chair. Next on the list is Representative Johnson. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Osmond, members, I, I have, don't have any questions. I have some concerns. Um, one is the dollar amounts, as uh, Representative Tice mentioned. Our uh, forecast is probably nil. Um, it's at 1.5 is uh, absolutely gone. I have no, no sense or no vision of having any type of, res of surplus right now. And our reserves are probably going to be spent just to fill, fulfill the budget for this next come rest of this year. I don't know where we're going to find a hundred million dollars. Even thirty million is going to be a tough stretch. But I have other concerns. Um, I was just read an article where the governor said he doesn't expect businesses to get opening up and running again for eighteen months. We are going to have such, uh, it's going to make the foreclosure situation of the Great Depression or the Great Recession look minor. Um, we need to do some things to start getting Minnesota opening up in a responsible way. Or 80% of, or 50 to 60% of our small businesses are going to be no longer around. I have a number of them that have already shuttered their doors permanently in my area. And small business is seven, 70 to 80 percent of the employers in Minnesota. We lose 50, 60 percent of them. It's going to take decades for Minnesota to get back on track. And I don't know how we're going to do that. Do this. We can't wait 18 months to get businesses up and running. We need to do that now. Otherwise, I don't see nothing but huge deficits, uh, even by the end of this fiscal year. Uh, so we need to start doing things to be very careful how we spend money. We need to get uh, make make sure that we're fiscally responsible. Uh, there's funding available for those in crisis now, um, but we have to be very very careful with the with the few dollars that we do have, if we do have any at all. Thank. You. Thank. Thanks, Representative Johnson. Next on the list. Um, Owen, are you there? Thank you, Madam Chair. Next on the list is Representative Bierman. Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thanks for all the comments and the testifiers today. I think I just wanted to, to state that I think that this bill delivers the help we need across the spectrum of housing need within our state and with the support and for the benefit of all the stakeholders. So I think it's a really good bill. And I, I want to speak my support for it. Uh, it helps the tenants, the landlords, and our financial institutions. And as far as I'm concerned, it helps businesses as well because it's quite, it's that fundamental bedrock. We can't solve all the problems with one bill, but the housing stability is a key issue for so many. So I want to just voice my support for that. I do have questions of the bill as far as how it is set up with the FHPAP, and one in particular is. Uh, the mechanism, how people who get into the program, how they are able to maintain and what some of the pitfalls might be that might 
kick them out of it at any certain given point because this is going to be going on for a while. So I, I, I would like to hear a little bit more about that. But I think in general, the bill is, is, is great in, as far as the scope. I think um, in contrast to some of the voices we've heard about the size of it, my, my worry is, is that it's not big enough. But if it's too much, you know, the money's going to stay there and we'll go back. So I think that structure is good. But um, I don't, time is short. We have more discussion, but and I can find out my answers to my questions from the FHPAP offline. But I uh, appreciate you bringing the bill forward and I give it my full support. Thank you. So uh, I'm, a, I'm assuming Ryan Baumchog is, is on from the department. So either he could speak to it now or if he, if he wanted to seek him out. Um, after the meeting to uh, clarify the FHPAP question you have? Sure, I mean, if he's available and we want to, he wants to address it now, my main question is just the, how onerous is it for people to apply and how can they ensure that they stay a part of the program and aren't uh, kicked off? And, and, and I presume they have a built-in mechanism for like monthly reporting as far as their situation as they move forward and that um, they have a handle on funds going out the door. So Ryan Baumchog, if, if you're on, and, and if you happen to hear that question. Yeah, Representative Hausman, this is Ryan. Can you hear me? Yes, did you hear the question? Great, I did. Representative Bierman, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, Minnesota Housing thinks that's actually one of the strengths of the FHPAP program, is that uh, the local administrators across the state work with individuals on a case-by-case -case basis to understand their specific issues. So they're able to look at an individual and a family and align them with the right resources, whether it might be short-term rental assistance, a one-time payment, or connections to other resources like uh, food assistance or others. So I can get uh, you more information about the eligibility, but I think that's one of the real strengths that we see in this program's delivery network. And that may there may be some follow-up we can do there too yet. Uh, next person. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next on the list is Representative Fisher. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, just want to mention a couple things. I think that the bill that uh, you've put out is a great bill. I think uh, there's a couple of good things that are being done in here. Is first of all, we've got the eviction protection there, and we've got it in law. And I think uh, an important thing that when we have this is that we're also doing what we can to make the la the. We just lost your vote. voice. Oh. Okay, uh, hope, we're are losing you your voice. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. I'm seeing some thumbs go up there. Thank you. Uh, I uh, I'm in a household and there's two others on conference calls here. So it's a little bit of a bandwidth issue. Um, but what I wanted to say is that 99% of our landlords out there are doing the right thing and take care of the people. And so we have a responsibility for the people that don't have the income now is making sure we're providing enough resources so that those landlords are being made whole for doing the right thing. I think that the $100 million, while might seem high, uh, is important to have out there for several reasons. Is We saw with the federal government when they put out their support loans for small businesses that it turned out the dollar amounts that the businesses needed was woefully inadequate and they had to come back and keep on coming back, get more money out there. But in the meantime, the small businesses need the money now and can't afford to wait. And I don't want our landlords to be that, in that same situation for doing the right thing. And another thing that really touches me a lot on it is that over the last couple of days, I've heard from people in communities of color. And one of the things I've been hearing from them real strongly is that right now, many of them are very depressed. Uh, they're feeling that no one hears them, no one sees them, and that because of where we are, nobody cares about them right now. And I think that the $100 million we have out there is something that's going to go a long way to address the concerns that they have out there and start to let them know that we are hearing them, we are seeing them, we do care about them. This is one of the ways that we can help address their needs to make sure they don't lose their housing. Thank you. Uh, Owen, how many more on the list? Uh, Representative Hornstein, and then last is Representative Howard. And so help me with the time. Uh, I, I, can we run over a few minutes? Uh, we have a hard end, day, uh, end time at 9.30. But uh, that's five minutes away. I, I don't know how, we're, um, how we might do this. Literally, we go off the air in five minutes? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. 
Well, uh, Representative mm -hmm. Hornstein and Representative Howard, just maybe quick concluding thoughts, Representative Hornstein. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, I, I strongly support this bill. I appreciate your work and the advocates' work. And, you know, when we talk about money, this has to be a priority along with health care and food security. These are basic needs of our people. So this has to be a priority in every budget decision. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Representative Howard. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief as well. Um, you know, I just want to highlight that what we heard from uh, landlords, uh, housing providers, housing advocates, the same unified message, which is that our uh, entire housing uh, continuum is facing an existential crisis, and that crisis is here now, uh, and that this bill and this funding stream is our role as a state of Minnesota to make sure that Minnesotans uh, can get through this the best they can. Uh, it, it, just a few other quick comments the hundred to the hundred million dollars and, and whether we can afford to do this. I would argue, uh, based on the testimony we heard today, we can't afford not to. Um, what is it going to look like for our economy long term if, especially if our, our small landlords aren't able to make their mortgage and we see uh, uh, foreclosures across the state that displace hundreds of Minnesotans? Uh, we heard that just in the month of April alone, there was a $60 million gap. What happens when that doubles? Um, what it, the the long-term budget implications of us not meeting the need in the now uh, are far greater, which is why the $100 million is necessary. Uh, and lastly, uh, to the issue of uh, congruence with the eviction moratorium. Uh, I think you froze again. Uh, can, can folks hear me? Yep. So the, the issue with the, I just want to call out that the way we get our economy back on track is if we meet the moment and clear this public health crisis. And the very worst- I think we're, I think we're losing you. I think, I think folks can hear me. Um, so the, the very worst thing that I, we, I, the very worst thing we can do in this moment would be to- I don't know, I don't know uh, if convict. others can hear, but I can't hear you anymore, right? Or, or some Howard. I think other folks are giving me the thumbs up. Um, so oh. <laughs> my last point that I want to make is that if we are allowing folks to be evicted and increase homelessness at the height and the peak of our COVID epidemic, which is what would happen under the Senate proposal, we prevent our economy from getting back on track. The way that we keep our economy moving and get it back sooner is meet the moment. And that's why this bill is so critical by supporting Minnesotans and making sure that they can stay home and stay safe and afford the roof over their head, that's how we meet this moment and that's how we get Minnesota back on track. And so I just thank everyone for the discussion and look forward to moving forward on the thank bill. Thanks. The chair renews her motion that House File 4541 as amended be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. The clerk will take the roll. All right, Representative Houseman. Houseman. I can't hear Blake. Is everybody else able Are to hear Are you there, me? Blake? I can hear you. Okay. Houseman? Aye. Okay. Howard? Aye. Tice? No. Bierman? Aye. Fisher? Aye. Gunther? Gunther? I'll come back to that. Uh, Representative Hassan? Aye. Representative Hurd? Aye. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Representative Johnson? No. Representative Jurgens? Hey. Sorry, could you repeat that? I heard the phone in the background. No. No. Representative Munson. No. Representative Pearson. No. Representative Poppy. Aye. And Representative Sock. Yes. And then again for Representative Gunther. All right. So the final total is 
nine votes in favor and five against. So nine ayes and five nays. There being nine ayes and five nays, the motion prevails and House File 4541 as amended is referred to Ways and Means. Thank you very much, members. We, I think we made it on time. 9.30. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.